Okay. Okay, so we're up. Apologies for that. We had some technical problems with the sound. Um, so yeah, so let's get started. Um, thank you very much for everyone who um, who's joined today. Um, the idea of this webinar was just for IDPC to kind of provide a bit of a debrief from the young gas. Um, you know, just to kind of digest some of the outcomes, some of the things that happened back in April in New York, and some of the things that didn't happen but we were hoping would. So we thought this would be a useful time, now that there's been a few months past, um, a useful time to go through some of the outcomes from the young gas, um, look at where we are, and, and in particular, look at what comes next. So I'm joined today by um, Heather Haas from New York and from the New York NGO Committee. Uh, who's going to um, speak a bit later about the civil society work that was done. We were due to be joined by um, Ricky Granaran from Indonesia as well, but unfortunately he's unable to join us today. Um, but Heather and I will take you through the, the, the webinar anyway. Um, you can comment um, and, and ask questions at any time, either using the chat forum on the YouTube page or via Twitter if you use the hashtag IDPCWebinar. Um, so if you put some questions on there, Heather and I will do our best to um, to answer those as we go or maybe at the end of a webinar if there's time. So moving on to the first slide, um, just to just give a better background for those who might, not, uh, who might not know, the UNGAS or the UN General Assembly Special Session, as it's called, on drugs, was requested by the presidents of Mexico, Guatemala and Colombia. Um, they petitioned the General Assembly to say that they, we need an urgent debate on drugs and it cannot wait until 2019. It has to be sooner. Um, that call was supported by 95 UN member states at the General Assembly and therefore the UNGAS was born. The UNGAS kind of came at a time when there were unprecedented calls for, for drug policy reform from governments, um, from regional groups, uh, also we had the state, we have the state level reforms taking place in the USA um, and also from high profile groups such as the Global Commission on Drug Policy. So there were high hopes for UNGAS to be a platform for some change and a change of direction in, uh, in drug policy. In the words of um, Ban Ki-moon, the United Nations Secretary General, um, he wanted the UNGAS to be an opportunity for a wide-ranging and open debate that considers all of the options. And this kind of mirrors what a lot of us were looking for. Um, you know, we wanted a, a, an UNGAS to be an opportunity for all the options and all the ideas to be put on the table and considered. So with that in mind, IDPC worked with our members to come up with a list of goals or, or asks for things that we wanted the UNGAS to, to do. Um, for those who might not know IDPC, we're a, a global network of NGOs. We have uh, more than 160 members from around the world. So we worked with these members to put together five main asks for the UNGAS. Firstly, and similar to the, to the Secretary General, we wanted an open and an inclusive debate. We wanted a debate that included civil society, but included all the member states, not just those that have a presence in Vienna, um, and also included all the UN agencies as well. We wanted the UNGAS to help reset the objectives of drug policy. So not just to focus again on ridiculous goals for a drug-free world, um, or a world free of drug abuse, but to reset the objectives so that we're instead looking at um, improving health and improving well-being. We wanted the UNGAS to support the new approaches that, would, that are emerging in, in parts of the USA and in Uruguay and elsewhere, um, that, you know, whether that be regulated markets, but also you know, the, the, the experience that a lot of countries have with um, decriminalization for example. So we wanted those to be explicitly supported at the UNGAS. Crucially, we wanted the UNGAS to call for the end of the criminalization of the affected populations. So for example, ending the criminalization of people who use drugs. And, and within this ask, we, you know, we obviously we wanted greater proportionality of, um, of drug sentences, um, but also um, the end of the use of the death penalty for drugs as well. 
And then last but by no means least, um, and this particular ask was devised in collaboration with Harm Reduction International. Um, we wanted the UNGAS to, to very clearly support the harm reduction approach to drugs, um, something that they've never been able to do explicitly in, uh, in Vienna before. So we thought the best way to kind of uh, digest what happened at the UNGAS would be to go through those five asks and kind of ask ourselves, well, did we get any of them? Did we win any of those, any of those battles in New York? So first of all, the, the, the idea of it being an open and inclusive debate. So there's a lot of positives. There are a lot of positives to take from Young Gas. Um, there was a greater involvement from across the UN family, as they call themselves, you know, greater involvement than we've ever had before. Um, we had uh, progressive contributions submitted from 15 UN agencies and some of the statements and, and interventions from UN agencies in New York at the Young Gas itself were, were among the highlights of the entire event. Um, civil society involvement was, we, we were visible, we had a strong presence, um, it was very well coordinated and Heather's going to talk a lot more about that, uh, but, you know, the, the pros and the cons later. Um, Part of that was the informal interactive stakeholder consultation, which was held in February in New York. Um, and many member states used their interventions to call for reform and debate and to question the existing approaches um, being applied. And, um, and the interventions, which Heather will talk about a bit later, you know, were again amongst the highlights of the UNGA. So there was a lot to be positive about. However, there was also um, mixed feelings and, and a lot to feel frustrated by. Um, the outcome document itself was negotiated behind closed doors. There was very little transparency, very little accountability, perhaps less so than, um, than in recent years for, for Vienna-based UN documents. And that was a big frustration. And, and also at the UNGAS itself, the outcome document was then approved at the beginning of the UNGAS, it was approved in the opening session and then closed. And that, I mean, that's a slightly strange way of doing things because it's meant to be an outcome. You know, it should, it should come at the end of the meeting and the entire meeting should be an opportunity to, to further that debate. Um, interestingly, at the high level meeting on, on AIDS, which took place in New York in June, they did the same thing. They had a, a, a slightly contentious political declaration, so they approved it at the very beginning of the meeting um, in order to shut down any possible further debate. Um, the outcome document itself, um, although as we'll discuss a bit later, there was, there's, there's quite a bit to be positive. Um, overall, it, it was not the honest assessment that we were hoping for. It, it does not um, accept the failures of, of uh, the, you know, the, the drug policy approach that's, that we've been implementing for 50 years, it, it doesn't provide that, that kind of um, reality check that many of us were hoping it would. Um, and as Heather will talk about a bit more, civil society participation, although our presence was strong, there were a lot of barriers put in our, put in our way um, to, to attending and, and being a part of that UNGAS. And the passes, the many, many passes being just one of those barriers. So the second goal was about resetting the objectives. Again, there were um, things to be positive about. The outcome document mentions and, and welcomes and it highlights the sustainable development goals. Um, this was an important link and we're glad that it's been made and it's made quite strongly in the outcome document. Um, there is specific mention of the target to end AIDS by 2030, which is linked to the SDGs. Again, it's, the, it's one of the first times we've managed to get a target of that kind referenced um, in, a, in a UN drugs document. Um, the document itself shifted from three pillars. It used to just focus on demand reduction, supply reduction, and international cooperation. But we managed to get the... Um, the structure shifted so that there were now seven themes, including a whole section on access to medicines, a whole section on human rights, and a whole section on development. So again, that's a huge step forward for, for, these, for these documents and these debates. Um, the UNGAS itself 
uh, the structure of the young gas reflected this new structure and reflected these new um, themes, including a whole round table on development, for example. Um, and at the young gas in their country statements, uh, by our count, six of the countries um, called for new objectives and new indicators um, for drug policy, which was positive. On the downside, the overall goal remains a society free of drug abuse. So we weren't able to put an end to this, this, uh, this strange language around, um, you know, a drug free world. Um, there was originally language in the document around new indicators and the development of new indicators, uh, but that language was eventually taken out of the document um, in, during the negotiations, which is disappointing. And when you look at the document now, particularly if you look at it now with relatively you know, fresh eyes, a few, a few months after it was agreed, the one thing that's glaringly obvious is there's, there's actually very little in there in terms of measurable targets. There's very little that, that we can go back to in three or four years' time to say, yes, this has happened or no, that has happened. It's very, um, very vague, which I guess is a, a natural result of a, of a consensus-based negotiation between countries. So thirdly, we looked at um, promoting new approaches. Again, some positives. According to our account, um, 18 member states um, were calling for a shift in the paradigm. Uh, so, you know, a move away from the war on drugs and a, a shift towards a more health-based approach. Um, 22 member states uh, called for the decriminalization mainly for, for uh, drug possession or for people who use drugs. Um, nine member states went even further and called for legal regulation, um, which again, these are all unprecedented amounts, you know, unprecedented numbers for, for a debate of this kind. It shows that we are moving in the right direction. And in amongst these member states that supported these new approaches, new alliances uh, you know, began to emerge, uh, the so-called Cartagena group of member states um you know from from europe latin america africa and the caribbean you know member states who who share a, a frustration at the existing um, nature of drug policies and, and share a desire to change things so that was good you know there's there, that was a lot of positives on the downside um the elephant in the room throughout the entire UNGAS was the need for the, the drug control treaties to be reformed. Um, you know, for example, you know, like thing, legal regulation, for example, remains outside of the scope of these treaties. So there were very few calls directly calling for the treaties to themselves be amended or reformed. And for many people, that was a big frustration because uh, therein lies the crux of the problem in many ways. Um, for similar reasons, the outcome document itself makes very little mention, well, makes no mention, sorry, of, uh, of the cannabis regulation that's taking place in, in various parts of the world, um, nor does it make any mention to the proposals for um, an, an independent expert advisory group that could have been we were hoping that could be one of the outcomes of the UNGAS in order to review the tensions that exist between the conventions and some of the drug policies and the new approaches being applied. And while we had a lot of countries calling for progressive drug policies and for decriminalization, um, there were also 24 countries that specifically called for the war on drugs, um, you know, that were happy to go along with a kind of more of the same kind of approach. Um, and 18 re reiterated their call for a drug-free world. I, th I think actually one member state claimed that they were drug-free and one member state claimed that they were practically drug-free, whatever that actually means. Um, but again, so this language, this drug-free world um, paradigm, still very much um, the, the fashion in, uh, at, at this debate. So linked to that was the ask for ending criminalization and um, improving proportionality, etc. cetera. Um, there were lots, lots of the UN agency contributions uh, called for decriminalization, which was fantastic to see, um, including the, the statements from UN AIDS and UN Women and UNDP. Um, they, I, I, would, um, I would recommend people having a look at those uh, 
those UN reports because they they're they're very good. They're on they'll be on the UNGAS website. And IDPC has also produced a report that tries to summarise the content of those, which you can find on our website. Um, the outcome document uh, calls for alternative or, or or additional measures with regard to conviction or punishment, which I think is probably as close to decrim the word decriminalisation as we could realistically get. So it's in there. You know, it's in the outcome document. That's a positive thing. Um, the outcome document also included the the word proportionality for for the first time, um, and the, the concept of proportionality. Um, although exactly what this means in practice is obviously open to um, open to interpretation. So, so some more work is needed to to really define what does proportionality mean for drug offences. Um, many countries, as as we've said before, many countries called for decriminalisation called for proportionality um, and 61 member states spoke uh, specifically against the death penalty which uh, was again a positive thing and the death penalty was was a prominent part of the debates um, in New York um, and there was a good acknowledgement for the need for a gender perspective um, and that was reflected in the outcome document. On the downside <clears throat> There was no specific mention of decriminalisation. Um, that language in the second point above was the closest we could get. Um, and the because of the consensus-based approach, there was no mention of the death penalty in the outcome document. So although 61 member states um, spoke against it, um, a smaller number of countries defended their right to use the death penalty and no consensus could be achieved once again. So that was disappointing. Um, and the country statements, just like the outcome document itself, they, they really they really showed the lack of consensus that exists on this on this issue. So the final ask was um, uh, a kind of support for harm reduction and support for the, the harm reduction decade, as as HRI um, put it. Again, the outcome document has some positives. The language in the document was the best we've seen from um, from a, a drugs-related UN document. Um, it includes naloxone, the, uh, the the overdose medicine. It includes that for the first time. A specific mention of naloxone, which is which is very welcome. Um, it includes needle and syringe programs and opiate substitution therapy, although they use slightly different terminology, um, but they're both in there as well. Um, harm reduction got unanimous support from the UN agencies, as you'd expect, um, and was supported by more than 30 countries um, in their country statements, which was, again, uh, very positive. And um, if you want to look more at these country statements, uh, you can look at the, the CND blog that we have at IDPC, so it's www.cndblog.org. Um, we've actually produced a series of maps that, that show you where where country statements fell in these key issues. So you can see a map of the 30 countries that spoke in favour of harm reduction and the only two countries that spoke against it. So that's useful in terms of try, you know, getting that visual sense of, of how this debate um, how this debate lies. Okay. Um, in terms of negatives, although the language was progressive, there was still they still could not agree to put the words harm reduction in the document. This is a, a, re, a repeating problem with um, the Vienna-based debates. They they just can't. It's, some countries support it, other countries reject it, and they can never agree the actual language itself. Um, interestingly, at the high-level meeting on, on HIV in June, the words harm reduction did make it into their political declaration once again. So there's a, there's a disconnect there between, between that forum and this forum on drugs. Um, the, uh, there was no acknowledgement that the 2015 targets for HIV, there was a target that by 2015 we would reduce HIV, new HIV infections amongst injecting drug users by half. Um, and this target was spectacularly missed, um, and that was we couldn't, in, we weren't able to get a reference to that in the document, despite some member states trying quite hard. Um, there was no call around the need to redirect funding, um, and there was again, as as we've said before, a continued focus on a society free from drugs, um, which runs counter to the harm reduction approach. So again, a mixed outcome um, with regards to harm reduction. 
so overall just to just to kind of wrap up on that i mean the basic feeling coming out of the young gas is one of i think mixed emotions there's some positives but also some big frustrations and, and a lot of things that we have to try and address as we move forward so you know a lot of the a lot of the civil society documents produced beforehand referred to you know is this diplomacy or is this denialism you know are they are they choosing not to talk about cannabis because um because it's diplomatically difficult to or are they just burying their heads in the sand um possibly more of the latter um Hank, can we go to the next slide yeah um the outcome document itself progress was made but overall the tone was not quite as revolutionary as many would have hoped for um the country statements were found were were much better they, they really did show the lack of consensus and they really did show the, the strength of feeling on some of these issues um and again the cnd blog um the cnd blog is is the the place to go if you want to look at these statements in detail and as heather will talk to in a moment the civil society voice was strong it was diverse it was engaging um and so there's a lot of positives to take from there but as I'll talk about a bit later in the webinar, there's obviously a lot of work to do now as we look towards the next big UN moment. So with that in mind, I'll, um, I'm gonna hand over to Heather who can introduce herself and then talk to you a bit more about the civil society component of the work. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Jamie. That was really informative and, and a great review. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to revisit all these things after some time has passed. Um, so I'm Heather Haas. I'm one of uh, I'm the chair of the New York NGO committee, but I'm also one of two vice chairs of the Civil Society Task Force for UNGAS 2016. And so I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about the task force and some of our work. Um, here's here are all of our pictures. Shiny happy people. <laughs> it's a good day. So um, is the Civil Society Task Force or the CSTF is, is, is sort of become known. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the task force, but I think it's, um, there's still a little confusion about it and um, a, good, a review is, is, is always good. So it was a joint initiative of the Vienna and New York NGO committees um, after uh, an extensive consultation with the members of the two committees, we convened the CSTF in March of 2015. The CSTF consists of 31 members, so there's a four-member steering committee, two from each, two representatives from each committee, and 18 regional representatives, that's two from each global region, and nine representatives from um, different thematic areas and global voices. So that's youth, families, uh, people who use drugs, recovered, uh, reco recovered drug users, farmers and then global voices criminal justice access to essential medicines prevention and harm reduction so what did we do over the course of the young gas our stated mission um, was to serve as the official liaison between the un and civil society in the young gas process and our objective from the beginning was to ensure a comprehensive, structured, meaningful, and balanced participation of civil society during the process. So in terms of balance, it was really important to us from the beginning that the, that the task force be balanced in terms of different viewpoints and perspectives. And then um, it, also that it was comprehensive. So we really sought to um, include NGOs from every part of the world and we, we wanted to reach those who might not otherwise um, have a voice at UNGAS and so one of the one of the I guess um, criteria for choosing task force members was to um, choose members who had wide networks that they could reach. So the activities of the task force we started out with a global civil society survey and a, and a report came from that, which also fed into the young gas process um, around the time that the zero document of the outcome document came out. Um, the survey was translated into 11 languages. It was dist distributed through um, email, websites, social media, uh, through, through many different networks, the UNODC civil society team, their field office network, the, the two committees, um, 
memberships and the and uh, the civil society task force members networks. So it's very widely distributed and it's solicited views from civil society on on themselves, their knowledge of ungas and their priorities for ungas. So we sought to sort of make, um, create a foundation. And then from there each of the task force members was responsible for conducting regional uh, and thematic consultations. So each person um, conducted a consultation in their geographic area or thematic area. And then, of course, we we collaborated with the president of the General Assembly um, with the support of the of UNODC to hold the informal interactive stakeholder consultation or the IISC, much shorter, um, in, in New York. And many of you saw, either watched it online or were there, I know that uh, there were over 300 civil society participants um, from, from everywhere and the speakers were, we were able to bring in speakers from all over the world um, and from many different thematic areas. So, uh, and that resulted in, in, a doc, in a summary document that was then a, an official document of the UNGAS. We were also tasked with speaker selection for the UNGAS and UNGAS related events. So that included uh, Commission on Narcotic Drugs roundtable discussions, um, you know, in the year leading up to UNGAS. Also the May 7th, 2015 high level thematic debate. We were, we were for the first time asked to select speakers um, by the office of the president of the General Assembly. And um, of course, the IISC, the stakeholder consultation, and then the actual UNGAS. And it's too bad that we were going to have one of those speakers from the UNGAS uh, roundtables here today. Um, and it's a shame he couldn't make it, but we'll we'll talk about that a little bit because it was one of the absolutely one of the highlights of the UNGAS. And then we produced a final report, which incorporated all of these different aspects. So. What was the result? We uh, felt that we had many achievements along the way, and of course there were challenges. So uh, one of our uh, biggest achievements, achievements is that I felt that we, we did uh, bring in the voices of, of grassroots into the debate. Um, you know, they came with their you know, recommendations on best practices, what's working, what can be improved, and there were many, there were many voices heard we felt in a meaningful way we also um i take particular pride in this i feel like we brought the cstf brought a, a lot of different voices and view, viewpoints together and we worked really well collaboratively with one another so it's not easy when you have that many different viewpoints not all um you know not all not all completely compatible bringing these together and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table is it's very difficult and I felt that we did a good job pulling these together and, and um, really setting aside our differences to work towards a common goal which is civil society inclusion I really felt that um, that 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 we were successful in that also there was really there was a high level of civil society input through the speakers at the CND roundtables, you know, the civil society hearings, which there were numerous um, hearings, and the UNGAS itself. So, and and finally, our, our report that at the end that we came out with, and there was also a five a five page summary of the report, which basically identified areas that we agreed in, and also areas that we disagreed. So we never set out from the beginning to come out with a declaration or a consensus document knowing that we have such diverse views. In fact, we sort of did it the opposite, that our diversity is really a strength and that we, we really wanted to just highlight, um, to actually just to paint a, an accurate picture of the civil society viewpoints. Um, and so I, I felt that we were successful at that and our report and the summary are on the CSTF website. Um, and one thing that's not on this list really is that the CSTF set a precedent for uh, civil society inclusion in high level general assembly events going forward. And it's a CSTF, a, a civil society task forces have been used in other areas, but never in the drugs area. So I felt like that was really successful that we were able to convene the task force and have it officially recognized by the UN system. 
So, of course, there were challenges, one of which was um, resources, of course. It's always, you always need more funding. Um, we had some, we had a few generous grants from foundations and member states, but not very many member states. So a pretty low percentage of member states actually contributed to civil society. We had some funding to do some, some pretty good work, but of course you could always use more. Um, the, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the logistical issues at UNGAS for a second, because if you were at UNGAS, or even if you heard about it, this is probably what you heard of, which is really a shame, because as Jamie was discussing, a lot of other good stuff happened at UNGAS. But um, a lot of people came away really just with this impression, with this, you know, impression of this horribly disorganized system. So whether it was, um, you know, these limited passes to events, which we weren't really aware of from the beginning, um, they, they sort of kept changing the, the, the informational statement. So people didn't know where to pick up passes, didn't know, nobody was aware that that you were going to have to have a pass for every single event, even though we had coordinated with um, with the with the UNDESA for a couple of months before. Um, yeah, so it was it was really a surprise to us that things didn't go smoothly. We expected some glitches, but the level of chaos was just it was it completely took us off guard. Um, we. Like I said, they went back and forth on instructions. There was some misinformation. It seemed that security and you and Dessa were sort of talking past each other, and there was nobody really taking responsibility for the problems. Um, a lot of literature was confiscated. I think that that last picture that Jamie was showing showed one of the documents that that had actually been taken away by security. Um, you know, and it was a little bit arbitrary because apparently security has their has has whether to take you know documents some people had to change their t-shirts because of um, prop supposed propaganda on their t-shirts so you know all of that was just a, a little bit weird I guess it was a little bit off-putting um, we also we didn't have a space for exhibits we didn't have a space for um, a t you know a table for literature even though we had asked numerous times so you know it was just sort of this general disorganization and and um, when we tried to get to the bottom of it there was, you know, there was, it was, it was just not very productive. So we, after UNGAS was, was all said and done, the Civil Society Task Force Steering Committee wrote a letter addressed to the Secretary General, the, the Deputy Secretary General, the President of the General Assembly, um, the Chair of the UNGAS Board, and the Executive Director of UNODC. Um, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty strong letter, and it's it's if it's not on the CSTF website, I'll make sure it's on there because everybody should see it. And we did receive a letter back, specifically from the Deputy Secretary General, that said that they would um, they would look into the issues, and they take it very seriously. And you know, there was a little bit of um, you know a little bit of. Uh, defensiveness but in general it, it was a positive letter um, stating that they would be conducting a review of the processes which is good so you know i'm not sure what the implications of the all of those problems are going forward to me i feel that we can take that and use it um, as a jumping off board to improve civil society inclusion not just in new york but um, maybe in geneva and um and in Vienna, although I think things are going there um, pretty well there as far as civil society inclusion. But um, if there is an if there is another review in 2019 in um, in New York, then we will definitely start early and, and push for a better process. Using this as an example, so. Um, oh, I guess one, I, I like to mention one more challenge. I, I, there were some, of course, political challenges, and I, um, it's a shame that Ricky isn't going to be here to talk about it with the, uh, you know, with this, with speaker selection, we, we often didn't get the exact, the speakers that we wanted because there was another, um, a government representative from the same nationality. Um, 
so sometimes we had to fight that and um, and finally there were some questions about how much our written input was incorporated into the system so um, okay so what is going to happen next I'm just going to talk briefly about the civil society task force because I think that what will happen next is a much broader question but um, so right after UNGAS, we conducted a second survey, an online survey, the, um, evaluating the Civil Society Task Force, and that uh, the report is also available on the website. The website, by the way, is, is www.cstfondrugs.org. Um, this, but I will say that the survey was overall positive, and um, it was really useful feedback. So uh, two thirds of civil society organizations said uh, rated the overall work of the civil society task force as good or excellent um there were some there were some criticisms which were which were fair and and you know appreciated um some were concerned about the mandate whether it was very clear um the inclusion of certain groups some felt that theirs weren't adequately representative represented um and if it was balanced some would have liked to have more outreach but i but in general the feedback was was pretty good uh, so going forward respondents said that uh, the clear majority said that they would they thought it would be useful to keep in place uh, to keep the CSTF in place towards 2019 and some thought that maybe the membership should be reviewed um, and maybe a clearer mandate in in view of uh, 2019 so the civil society task force steering group um, has just committed to revisiting the issue as we move forward towards uh, 2019 but whatever happens with the task force we're we're um, looking forward to continued collaboration with the two committees and um you know dc civil society team and, and of course other partners so with that i'm going to um, turn back to jamie and i think we're going to get questions thank you very much heather that's that's great and um yeah, and thank you for all your work with the CSTF. It was, uh, like I said before, it was one of the big positives that came out of the Young Us. Um, remember, um, for those following this on YouTube, it, it, you, cannot, you can submit some questions or comments either in the comment section on the YouTube page or by using the Twitter hashtag IDPCWebinar. Um, and Heather and I will, will do our best to answer those as we go. Um, just a quick, I mean, here's a, here's a picture on screen now of, of, of Ricky delivering his um, awesome presentation, uh, his awesome intervention at the, uh, at the Young Gas. Um, really moving, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd recommend it. It's uh, available on the IDPC channel on YouTube. Um, you've got the links there below. Um, and uh, we've tried to capture all of the, all of the civil society interventions um, from the Young Gas there. Um, and other key um, other key kind of moments and presentations. So please do visit that if you get a if you get a chance. Okay, so um, just before we finish up, then just to talk a little bit more about about what comes next. So um, at this exact moment in time, there's actually two processes taking place: um, one in Vienna and one in New York, which which relate to this this uh, this time frame over the next few years. So. Um, in Vienna, uh, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs ha is holding a series of intercessional meetings, as they call them, um, to discuss the UNGAS outcome document. They're going through it chapter by chapter, reviewing the document, reviewing what they've committed to, and talking about how how is this going to be implemented in countries. Um, it was felt that that was an important process for them to go through. Partly to give the UNGAS document, you know, to make sure that it doesn't just get put on a shelf and forgotten about. Um, like I said, I mean, we may, there may be, you know, some areas of it that we're not happy with, but overall there was a lot of progressive language in the outcome document, which we can now make the most of. So that's what's happening at the United Nations in Vienna. And the next meeting, they had a meeting that took place at the beginning of October. And again, you can visit the CND blog to um to to catch up on what was said um and the next meeting will take place on the 27th and 28th of october in vienna um i mentioned this specifically because there is still an opportunity 
to apply to make an intervention, a civil society intervention at that meeting. Um, it's being coordinated by the Vienna NGO committee, the VNGOC. The deadline is the 20th, so tomorrow, Thursday the 20th of October is the deadline. Um, you can visit the VNGOC website or if you can email contact at idpc.net if you're interested and we will we will show you how to how to make your application. So I just wanted to mention that quickly because that's a big opportunity. Um, at the same time, over in New York, uh, discussions are, are currently taking place on what's called the Omnibus Resolution on Drugs, um, which is an annual resolution uh, negotiated by the Third Committee in New York. Um, and again, that includes a lot of reflections on the young gas. It directly includes a lot of language that was agreed in the outcome document. But crucially, it's, it's the first attempt to start thinking about, well, what happens next in terms of the UN process? So 2016, you know, the, the Young Gas April 2016 has now passed. And it kind of leaves us in a bit of a vacuum in terms of what happens next, because we have a political declaration on drugs agreed at the United Nations, and, and that was agreed in 2009. So the expiry date, it was a 10 year plan. So the expiry date is 2019. Um, and by 2019, according to that plan, the world should have eradicated or significantly reduced drug markets, drug supply, drug demand, drug use, etc., which obviously will not happen by 2019. So we are working on the assumption that 29, there has to be some kind of moment in 2019, some kind of UN moment or meeting, because they've got to review whether or not that political declaration was a success. They've got to review whether the targets were met or not. Um, and obviously, so 2019, that was the year when the UNGAS was originally supposed to happen before the presidents of Mexico, Guatemala and Colombia asked for it to be brought early because they need to have the discussion more urgently. So at the moment, it's, it's a bit of an unknown what exactly is going to happen in 2019. But that's also a big opportunity for us because it means we can start advocating now for, for something to happen in 2019 that builds on the momentum of the young gas. Um, I mean, as we've mentioned before, the outcome document itself may, may the overall tone of it might be disappointing, but the UNGAS as a, as a moment in, for the drug policy movement was pivotal. It really helped us to, to build momentum, to get people on board, to raise awareness of our issues. And so now it's important that we look towards 2019 or thereabouts, you know, the next UN meeting to, to perform that same function, to keep people engaged, to keep this debate going and to build on the progress that we've made. One key thing for us, um, and uh, I think this is something that, that um, our supported member states would agree with, I think the, the UNGAS outcome document having seven chapters rather than just three, so now it has a, you know, a chapter dedicated to development and access to medicines and to human rights, as well as one on, on public health and, and demand reduction. That's a positive thing, and I think we really need to try and make sure that any future declaration or any future action plan does um, does also focus on those same seven thematic areas. Um, it would be, in my opinion, it would be we'd be it, we'd be sliding back now if we went back to the, the the original structure, which was just demand reduction, supply reduction, and international cooperation. I think the seven thematic areas is a really positive thing. So that's one thing that we're pushing for. And in amongst that, that means that the document will give greater prominence towards public health, towards human rights and towards development, for example. So one proposal that, that we're putting forward at the moment, and, and IDPC are working with TNI and others to develop a, a briefing note on this for, for our members and for member states, the, the proposal for 2019, based on what's happened in the past, would be a three-step process. So the first step would be, in 2019, there should be some kind of meeting or some kind of process that evaluates what happened over the last decade. It evaluates whether the last plan of action was a success or not. 
Um, given that the target was a drug-free world, I think we all know how that evaluation should go. But that would be step one. And I think it's important because it's important to separate that evaluation step from developing a new document. Because if those, if you're evaluating the old one and developing a new one in the same at the same time, we're not going to spend enough energy on the evaluation. And I think that's really important to do. So that, that would be step one. And that could then lead to step two. Uh, this is something that is, is currently being suggested in the, um, the omnibus resolution being, being negotiated in New York. You would then, having evaluated what happened over the last 10 years, you would then allow yourself a period of reflection or a period for debate. And that could involve setting up uh, working groups to work on each of those seven themes. So you'd have a working group on demand reduction, a working group on human rights, and a working group on development, for example. And those working groups could really start to explore the issues, really start to explore the challenges, and really start to, to plan the way forward in terms of what needs to change for the next 10 years. And we would, um, we would urge that those, uh, those working groups were inclusive. So you had governments and UN agencies and NGOs. Um, and we would, also, we would also advocate for them to be chaired by the relevant UN agencies. So for example, if there's a working group on development, that should be chaired by UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, because they are the experts from within the UN system. So that would be the step two that we're proposing, and that would then lead to step three, which would probably be in 2020 rather than 2019 in order to allow enough time. But in 2020, you can then start the process of drafting and negotiating the new political declaration, the new plan of action. Um, and if you do that in 2020, and it's a 10 year plan, that also then aligns itself perfectly with the sustainable development goals, because the deadline for the sustainable development goals is 2030. So you would, you would then have a, two, a 2020 to 2030 period where a new political declaration, hopefully reflecting the, the, the deliberations of these working groups, could be agreed and could take us forward. And, and, and like we said before, build on the momentum that we have. So that's what we're proposing. Um, before, before I move on to the last slide, let's just, uh, we have a question. How do you engage academics for private sector and patients in presenting sustainable solutions when it comes to drug policy? Okay, so in the future, I think, you know, when we're talking about these working groups, I would very much hope that they would engage academia for a start and hopefully would engage affected populations, patients, um, and the private sector as well. Because as we were saying before the young gas, and you know, to, to reflect back to Ban Ki-moon's statements, this needs to be an open and honest discussion. This needs to be in a discussion where everyone who is affected by these issues can have their say. So there are lots of things happening, particularly around academia. At the moment, there's, um, there's a scientific network that's being operated by UNODC. There's, there's one that focuses on demand reduction and one that focuses on HIV prevention and HIV uh, treatment. And these have been quite positive. These are, these are mechanisms that, that UNODC have put in place to make sure that the scientific community is inputting into these, into these debates um, just as strongly as civil society and just as strongly as the UN agencies. So there is already an effort to engage academia, um, but I think more can be done. And I would like to think of these working groups, for example, they could be a good opportunity. Um, not enough is really being said about how to engage the private sector. It's a very good point. Um, they've not been engaged, uh, particularly in the debates. And so that's definitely um, a sector that we need to work more on. Um, as, as a drug policy sector, we need to do more, all of us need to do more to engage the private sector. Um, and in terms of um, the affected populations, well, I mean, as Heather said, you know, they are a core part of any effort to involve civil society. You can't involve civil society if you're not going to include um, the affected populations who, you know, who are impacted by drug policies. Um, so again, I think, you know, very much in our thinking for 2019 onwards, any, 
any process or any actions really to be effective it's got to include civil society it's got to include the affected populations patients and it's got to include academia um if it doesn't do those things as far as i'm concerned it's not a valid process um so yeah so I, I, it's a very good question and um it's something that we definitely have to keep an eye on as we move forward um okay so let's move on to the last slide um unless heather unless you had anything to add um, I would just add that we, uh, you know, we, we did this, that one limited evaluation survey, but I didn't mention that the, the survey itself really didn't have a really high response rate. It was right after unguessed, so maybe that's just unguessed fatigue. Um, it had about 190 respondents. So I think that the, there's an opportunity there to do broader consultations and to really identify some of the things that were missing in this last process forward. So I think there's a real appetite to do that. And, and so I appreciate that question. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Um, okay, so I think um, we're going to end in the absence of any other questions. Um, just to say that um, if you have any questions after the webinar that you want to ask us, it's what we're here for at IDPC. So you can contact us. The email address is up there on the screen now. Um, we really encourage you to contact us, in particular if you're interested in making an intervention in the, at the UN meeting um, uh, next week. So the deadline is, is tomorrow, the 20th of October, and interventions can be made in person or by video link. Um, so you don't have to be able to travel to Vienna. You know, they've, they've, it's, it's being designed in a way that people can intervene wherever they are. So... Um, Please do let us know if you have any questions and um, and you can also visit our website and also the CND blog um, and the Support Don't Punish website um, uh, to, to find out more about all of this, um, all the UNGAS and, and the post-UNGAS work. Um, and UNODC now has also created a post-UNGAS website, um, which uh, you can also look at to see what's going on um, in Vienna. So that would be www.unodc.org slash post ungas2016. Um, and on that, you can find details of the meetings taking place in Vienna, etc. So thank you very much for your time and for, for participating today. And um, we, we will be following up with more webinars in the future. Um, there are webinars in French and Spanish um, covering the same ground as this, they will be coming in the, they are in the coming days. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we hope to speak to you all soon. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks for everyone to, for listening in. Thank you. Bye.